Morning, everybody. How's y'all doing today? Good week? Good week? We had a great week. Uh, man, a lot of things went on this week. We had uh, um, last Sunday, Carrie Ann and I were, were out of town, and, and I was running a race, and, and that went great. Uh, my wife lied to me. She did. She did. We're sitting there ready for the race, and I had a particular goal I wanted to reach, and she goes, you can do it. And I run the race, and we get done, and, and I, I met my goal. And she, she's there. She hugs me at the end. She goes, I didn't think you could do it, but you did. <laughs> oh, well. oh, well, that happens, right? Well, it was a good week. Hey, I, I want to just uh, a couple quick things. If, if you're one of our winter family members here, and I know some of you are already talking about going back home and all that stuff, um, please, before you leave, make sure you get the church your um, phone number, your email address. We send out regular communications, and we'd love to stay in contact with you. And we'd love you to stay in contact with us. If you have any prayer needs or anything that we can do for you down here, please let us know. Um, we're all in this together, and uh, you're part of the family here. So please uh, give that information to the church. You can just fill out a Connect card with that information on it, and we'll make sure that it's processed properly. And the other thing is, uh, you know, many of you um, come today, and you have these, these little people with you. And this week, this week, Carrie Ann and I kept two of our granddaughters. Um, we had them for, I think it was 22 hours. It was 20, but who's counting? But who's counting? And it's just amazing how much life changes when you when you have little people around you. And and you know, uh, coming to church on Sunday morning is easy for me because I just jump out of bed and, and come. You know, and and so many of you others, you don't. You you have to get kids up. You have to get kids ready, and you do that five days a week, getting them ready to go to school and all that stuff. And it's one more day a week. And and I just want you to know that. That, that your sacrifice, first off, it's worth it. What you're building in your kid's life and you're valuing worship and you're valuing a relationship with God and you're modeling that. And just, just good on you. That is awesome. But I also want you to know that we, we recognize that sacrifice. And it is hard. And so thank you for doing it. It is worth it. I promise you. And uh, just keep up the good work, guys. And we're, we're thrilled to be able to partner with you as parents. Um, that's our role. We, we just want to partner with you as, as your parenting your kids. Now, I know some of you here today, you had to take extra ibuprofen to come. And so on the other end, that was me after t running that race. I'm still very sore and getting up and taking ibuprofen, but we're glad you're here. Hey, we're starting a whole brand new uh, sermon series called The Whole Story. And I'm, I'm super excited about this because, because, you know, I've met a lot of people, and maybe you're one of these people, who have come to me and they said, you know, I get Jesus. Jesus, I get. I, I, I get Jesus. I understand that. I kind of kind of understand the whole love your neighbor, serve one another. You know, there's some things about Jesus dying for my sins. Okay, I, but I sort of get that, and, and I get that. But I, I don't get the rest of that stuff. I mean, what is, what is a cataclysmic flood that kills everybody, annihilates humanity, except eight people and two of every kind of animals? What has that got to do with for God so loved the world, right? I mean, I mean, how do you how, how do how do you put all these pieces together? I mean, and then then you begin to read about these kings who are who are supposed to be leading God's people, and they they do anything but but lead God's people to God, right? They're just selfish and horrible and evil. What what is what does that have to do with anything? And then then have you read the book of the Revelation? Have have you read that? Have you wondered what he was taking when he was writing that? I mean, it's, it's just strange. It's weird. And yet, and yet we have it all. How does it all fit together? And, and, I, and for some people, they're just like, you know what? You know what? I, I get Jesus. I get Jesus. And, and I, I'm just going to stop there. I'm just going to stop there. And I'm like, okay, okay. But, but here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. If all you do is take Jesus and you don't, you don't take the fullness of what God has revealed himself to us in his word, you're missing out on knowing who God really is, the fullness of God. And I believe the more we know God, the more we'll learn to trust God, the closer we'll walk with God, the more we will love him, and the more life we'll experience through him. And so our goal in this series, our teaching team, is, is we want to put, in the next 10 weeks, we want to put the whole story together for you. We want to put it all together for you so, so it can begin to make maybe just a little bit more sense of how all these events, the Tower of Babel, right? The prophets Ezekiel and, and Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea and all of these people. 
how it all begins to make sense together and ultimately so that you can grow closer in your relationship with Christ. And it all starts off, I mean, and, and the pinnacle of it all is, is Jesus. I mean, the simple answer of what is the whole story, I mean, if you want the simple answer, it's, it's really Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes that, and he tells us that in the book of Galatians. Here's what he says. He says, God, when God, when the time was right, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Here's what Paul says. He says, when the time was right, in other words, everything had to be put in place before we got to Jesus. All these things had to happen ahead of time so that when Jesus came, we would understand what he's really talking about. We would understand what he really does for us. We would understand a little bit more of who God is so that when Jesus came and does what Jesus does, because here's the other part, Paul writes, when the time was right, when everything was ready, God sent Jesus. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. God had a specific purpose for Jesus. He had a specific job to do. He was to pay the price for our sins, and we'll begin to understand that a little bit more through the whole story, with the ultimate goal of what? Here's the ultimate goal. So that we could be adopted, so that God could adopt us as his very own children. What's the whole story? The whole story is this. When the time was right, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And that's Galatians 4, 4 through 5. And, and through this 10 weeks, what I want to challenge all of us to do is to commit this verse to memory. So you might want to write it down. If you have your uh, worship guide with you today on the back, you can just write Galatians 4, 4 through 5. And that's the 50,000-foot view of everything that goes on in Scripture. When the time was right, God sent his son Jesus to do a specific job to pay the price for our sins so that we could be adopted into his family. So, so that's the 50,000-foot view, but let's fly down a little lower to about 40,000 feet. And let's see if we can't begin to break down the timeline here and begin to understand the work of God just a little bit better and what the whole story is about. And I want to try to make this simple for you. So, so it really begins right here. I'm going to break down the Bible into three distinct parts. Three parts. Simple, easy to remember. Three parts. The first is right here at creation. Genesis 1 through 2. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created. This is where the whole story begins. It all begins here. It begins at creation. Genesis 1 through 2. God creates the world, and the world is good. He creates humanity, and the world is very good, and everything is great and fine until we hit the second phase. And the second phase is Genesis 3. See, what happened when God created the world and, and you have to ask the question, why did God create you? Why did God create you and me? Well, the, we are told that God created us because he wanted a relationship with us. He wanted to know us, and he wanted us to do life with him. And in fact, the Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end of humanity? It's to enjoy God and to know his presence forever. Here's the way the Apostle Paul writes that. He says, whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everything you do, everything you do is all about enjoying God and knowing his presence and walking with him. God wants to be in a relationship with you. That's why he created us. Now, in order to be in a relationship with you, that means he has to, in creation, he had to give us this gift called free will. Some of you remember this. Some of you remember this back in the 80s. Some of you weren't in the 80s, but for those of us who were in the 80s, right, um, there was a song that came out in 1986 by a group called Huey Lewis and the News, and, and it was called Stuck With You. You remember that song? It's like, yes, it's true, and then there's a refrain, yes, it's true. I'm so what? Happy to be stuck with you, right? Let's try it. I'm so, I'm so not happy that you had me do that in church today. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to be stuck with you. I used to hear that song on the radio because I was alive in the 80s. And, like, and, and, and it would come on the radio and everybody would sing along. And I thought, this is the stupidest song in the world. How can I be happy if I'm stuck with you? Now, maybe I was thinking of my girlfriend at the time. I'm not sure. But anyway, right? Right? 
But if you're in a relationship and you're stuck, you have no free will, right? That doesn't feel too happy. That doesn't feel like a joyful relationship. When God created humanity, he gave us this gift called free will, and he wants us to be in relationship with him. Problem is, problem is, that was all great in Genesis 1 through 2. First part, God created. Second part, Genesis 3, you know what happened in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve decided that, well, they want it to be their own God. And here's the deal. If you're in a relationship with God, God wants to be in a relationship with you. Here's the deal. He has to be God because he is. And there cannot be two gods in a relationship. And so what happens in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I don't have to follow anybody. I can be my own boss. I'm not going to listen to anybody, although they did listen to somebody in Genesis 3, right? They listened to Satan. He said, hey, you can be just like God. All you've got to do is eat from that tree that God told you not to. You just have to disobey him. And in that moment when they ate from the tree, disobeying God, what happened? Well, at that moment, something entered into our world, something that was not in Genesis 1 and 2, and that was death. Death entered our world in Genesis 3, and death was more than just a physical death, which would happen to Adam and Eve, but it was also a spiritual death where they would be separated from God. They'd be separated from the family. They chose to leave. And so the Bible tells us that God drove man out of the Garden of Eden, and he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You might want to hold on to that tree of life because we'll get there in the book of Revelation. But at that time, in Genesis 3, everything changed. So first part, God created. Second part, people broke it. And then we hit Genesis 4. And Genesis 4 is from this part right here. Whoop, try and do this. From here all the way to here. And the rest of the Bible, the rest of the Bible, I mean, we just went through two phases in three chapters. Genesis 1 and 2, God creates. Genesis 3, got people break. And Genesis 4, throughout the rest of the Bible, is all about God's attempt to bring us back into relationship with him. So if you want to remember the whole story, here it is. God makes, we break, and then God tries to <laughs> recreate. God recreates. God is wanting to bring his family back together again. And that's the story. That's the, the whole story. And ultimately, that story will come to a culmination in Jesus. But until we get there, we've got to ask the question, well, what was the flood about? And, and Abraham and Moses and all the kings and the prophets. And then after Jesus, we've got to ask, well, well, what about the Holy Spirit and the church? And then and then Jesus is returned when God will literally come and physically reunite his family. You see, that's, that's the whole story. And so today, as we get into this story, we want to begin with the flood. How does the flood get us and help us understand Jesus? Well, remember, the flood comes after what? Genesis 1 and 2, God creates. Genesis 3, we break. And Genesis 4, God begins to the process of wanting to reunite his family together. And it's not an easy process. Because the Bible says that in Noah's day, things were pretty bad. In fact, here's the scripture, Genesis 6. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. All the time evil. The Lord regretted, check that word out, the Lord regretted that he made human beings on the earth and he was, his heart was deeply, deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's a tough story. I mean, how do you really begin to think about 
God destroying every living thing on the earth except eight people and two of each kind of animal. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, that's, that's hard to fathom. That's hard. That doesn't feel good inside. That doesn't feel very Jesus-y, does it? And yet, let me remind you who it was that created. It is God who created. God is the giver of life. And God was ultimately the, the taker of life. And see, see, that doesn't feel good. But see, that's, that's his role because he is, he is God. And so God looks down, and in God's attempt to do what? To reunite his family. That's God's purpose. He wants to reunite his family. In God's attempt to do that, what does he do? He says, you know what? We need to come, and we need to start over again. We need to hit the redo button. And so what I'm going to do is, is I want to find the best of the best on the earth. I want to find the best of the best on the earth, and we're just going to put them all in the ark, and he gives them really specific instructions on what the ark is supposed to look like. So specific, in fact, that they've actually built replicas of the ark. In fact, our church is going to do a tour to the, to the ark museum to, um, up in August, I think. And so that's coming up. But it's specific instructions. And he says, Noah, I want you to put you and your family on this ark and save the animals. And we're just going to start over with you. And why Noah? Because the Bible says that Noah, Genesis 6, 9, was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, notice it doesn't say Noah was perfect. It says he was blameless among the people of his time. He was the best of the people of his time. But where was Noah's heart? Noah wanted what? Noah wanted to be in relationship with God. He walked with God. He desired God. He wanted to be with God. And God chose Noah to hit the redo button and to start this thing all over again. And some of you know the story, right? It took years to build the ark, and once they built the ark and they got the animals on the ark, the Bible says that it, it rained for 40 days, but more than rained for 40 days, the, the waters actually came from the, the springs of the earth. It actually flooded up through, and, and it flooded the entire earth. The entire earth. And then, for the another 331 days, Noah and his family floated around on this ark with... Uh, all these animals on it. And at the end of a total of 371 days, the ark finally hit dry ground. And the Bible says God opened the door, and <laughs> can you imagine the mass exodus to get off that critter, right? And Noah and his family got off the ark, and the first thing Noah did was he got on the phone, and he called his family therapist and said, we got to talk, right, after being on the ark that right? No, no. First thing Noah did when he got off of the ark was he he built an altar, and he, he worshiped God. Noah's heart was to follow God. That's what he wanted, to follow God. And they get off the ark, and it's amazing. See, see, see they, just, they just wanted to redo. They just wanted to start over. God says, I'm going to reunite my family. i got to get my family back together. So the first thing I'm just going to do, I'm going to take the best of the best, and we're just going to redo this thing. We're just going to start over. And, and what's interesting is, is look at the promise of the, 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 and the command that God gave to Noah and his family. It's very familiar. In fact, it's similar almost exactly to the one he gave Adam and Eve. Noah gets off the ark, and God says to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And increase upon it. God says, I'm going to just start, start all over again. You guys do it right this time. Don't mess it up. Do it right. Right? God would go on. He would say, now I establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah and his family, you and your descendants after you, with every living creature that was with you, the birds, with the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all of life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And Many of you know the story. It says, and I'm going to put my sign in the sky, a rainbow in the sky, to prove that to you, that I'll never do this again. And what I want you to notice there is this word that God uses twice, and that's the word covenant. God says, here's the way I want to relate to you. I'm making a deal with you. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my, my people. And so, in an attempt to reunite his people, right, because, again, what happened? 
God created it, and we broke it. God's attempting to recreate it, to reunite us to his family. He says, let's hit the redo button. Let's just start this whole thing over again. And, and, and isn't, that, isn't that what grace is all about? Let's just start over again. Let's just forget what happened and just, just kind of take a new step. I mean, isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that grace? Have you ever tried that kind of grace? You ever come home and say, honey, I'm so sorry we had that huge fight. I'm sorry I said the things that I said. Can we just forget it? Let's just act like it never happened. Let's just, let's just, let's never talk about it again. Let's never discuss it. Let's, let's just go forward. You ever do that at work? Fire off that email? And then you quickly fire off another one and says, hey, um, that email that I just sent you, would you please not read the one that's right before this one? Can you just like forget it? Can, could, you, <laughs> could you delete that email before you read it? How many of you would delete that email? <laughs> Thank you for being honest people in this room. Yes, there ain't no way I'm deleting that email. It's like, what'd you hit me, right? You see, does a redo ever work? See, we, we want to redo it. We just want to redo. We just want to say, you know, just, just forget what happened and let me just start over again. Let's just start over again. Let's just, let's just forget everything that happened here and, and we get to the flood. Let's just start over again. Adam, or is Adam and Eve's over. We're going to start with Noah and his family. And everything is fine, except it's not. Because the same human nature that walked onto the ark is the same human nature that walked out of the ark. Let me say that again. Everything is not fine because the same human nature that walked onto the ark is the same human nature that walked off of the ark. And amazingly, God actually knew this was going to happen. Look what God says in Genesis 8, 21. He said, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. That's what God said. He said the human heart that walked onto the ark is the same human heart that walked after the ark, walked out of the ark. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all the living creatures as I have done. This is what he said after the flood. See? See, and, 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 and here's the problem, folks. Here's the problem with the redo effort. See, many times that's what we want to do with our relationships. We just want to redo. And when our, with our relationship with God, we just say, hey, can't, can't we just redo this thing? Can't we just start over? Can't we just forget the past? But salvation... Entering back into God's family is not hitting a redo button. Salvation is about transformation. It's about change. And what God wants to do in our life is he wants to take the heart here in Genesis 3 that that said, I want to be selfish. I want to be my own God. I want what I want, and I don't care about anyone else. God says that kind of heart needs to be change. And when we come to Jesus Christ and we yield ourselves to him, what we are yielding is our heart to him. And we're saying, God, I want you to recreate my heart. I, I need, I want to change. You see, just hitting the redo button never works. I mean, I mean, that's why you keep going back into the same patterns that you keep going back into. You say, I'm tired of being angry all the time. I'm tired of being frustrated all the time. I'm just going to stop. Well, good luck. Because if nothing changes, guess what? Nothing changes. And the same human nature that gets you angry all the time, that gets you frustrated all the time, until that begins to change, your outcome is going to be the same. You see? Salvation, a relationship with God, getting back into God's family is more than just being forgiven, more than just saying you can start over again. It's about a heart transformation. Formation. And you say, well, well then, well then what happened with the flood? Why, why did God even do that? Because he knew what we would do. 
He knew you and I. He, he knows human nature. And he says, listen, here's the deal. We as humans, we got to understand the flood doesn't work. The redo button doesn't work. Just hitting the redo button doesn't change human hearts. And we have to see that. We have to know that. We have to experience that if we're going to get to Jesus. Because when Jesus comes, Jesus is going to tell us, I'm willing to forgive you for all of your sins. I'm going to die for your sins. Do you realize whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, he has already died for your sins? But what Jesus wants to do is he wants to transform your heart and open your life to receive all that God has for you and bring you back into a relationship with him and his heavenly father. And that only happens through heart transformation that only, only Jesus can bring. You see, that's, that's what the prophet Ezekiel told us about, or God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel told us about. See, this is God's desire. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. A new heart and a new spirit within you. And so this morning, as we begin to think about this whole story, what is the Bible all about? It's all about being reunited here with our Heavenly Father. Reunited with, in God's family. And in order to do that, he says, I want to give you a new heart. I want to transform your heart. Some of you are here and you're saying, I just want to start over again. I just, I, I'm tired of living the way I am. I'm tired of, tired of going down that road. I want things to change in my life. Some of you have said that for years. And some of you know nothing has changed. And the reason nothing has changed is because you're dealing with with the method of the flood, just hit a redo button and hoping that that's going to reunite you into God's family. And friends, it's just not enough. It just doesn't work. What does work is Jesus. And we'll get there as we talk about the whole story, but you can get there today by simply saying, Jesus, I'm tired of living this way and I'm, I'm sorry. I want to hit the redo button. I just don't want to go back. Can you help me not go back? Can you help change my thoughts? Can you help change my habits? Can you change my outlook on life? One of my favorite people in this room will tell you today that he's not the same person that he used to be. He laughs at me and he says, Jimmy, I don't know what's happened to me. It's kind of scary. <laughs> and then I smile, and I just say, yeah, isn't God good? You see, he's fine in life. And our hope for you in this whole series is not to give you some new information. Our hope for you is that you will ultimately experience heart transformation. And so today, I just want to invite you to say yes to Jesus. Just say yes. And it's really just that simple. And so Sean's going to play a little more for us. And I'm just going to invite you to spend some time with Christ. And if you're tired, if you've been trying to hit the redo button, trying to reset, trying to make things right, guess what? It doesn't work. You can't do it on your own. But if you say yes to Jesus, he promises to make all things new. So, Father God, in these next few moments, we just open our heart to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we, we sang earlier. We were calling out to you. You come and fill us again. And so, God, there's many people in this room that just need to be filled again. People who have yielded their lives to you, and maybe we've, we've fallen back into some old habits. And we just need to cling a little closer to Jesus, a little closer to you. Lord, there's others in this room that are just tired of living the life they've been living. They want something more. They want hope. They want real peace. They want real life. They want to get back in a relationship with you, God. As they call out to you this morning, Lord, would you speak deep to their heart? And would you begin that process of transformation that you promised us you would? 
through the power of Christ in his work on the cross. Thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. So God, as you have heard our prayers this morning, we lift our souls to you, and we simply ask God that you would continue to do the work in our lives that you want us to do. We declare that life with you is best. Life in your family, God, is just best, and you want that. And so Lord, may we know the truth of what it means to be fully reunited with you through Jesus Christ. More than a redo, we seek transformation. We ask it in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen.